I'm really not good with technology. Um, can everybody see the slides okay? Yep. Okay. Yes, yeah, we can. Perfect. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Alana. I'm one of the EMs this year. Um, and for my talk today, we're just going to be doing a um, short discussion around um, the use of short-term glutocorticoids in the eMERGE department, um, and as well as talk about some of the associated complications that we might see. Um, so we'll get started right away, just because we have lost some time. Um, I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest um, to disclose this morning, um, and I want to spend a huge special thanks to Dr. Christine Richardson, um, who not only volunteered semi-last minute to be my supervisor for this talk, um, but also helped um, come up with the topic idea. Um, not sure if she's actually on here today, because I know she's uh, working a 24-hour shift in Clinton. Um, I'm here, Alana. Oh, lovely. Um, so our objective, objectives for this morning, um, we're just briefly going to review the physiology and some pharmacokinetics of glucocorticoids. Um, we'll briefly touch on the indications for their use in the eMERGE department, as well as go over some of the short-term complications of glucocorticoid use. Um, and for that, I tried to focus on some of the less common complications or things that we wouldn't uh, commonly think of that I found in the literature. Um, so we'll just start with a case. Um, so pretty typical case, 63 year old female, known COPD coming in with um, worsening shortness of breath, worsening cough and increasing sputum. She's not febrile. She has been using her Ventolin five to six times a day and is compliant with her other inhalers. Um, she does continue to smoke uh, despite multiple discussions with healthcare providers for her to quit. Um, and she's not currently needing some, any supplemental oxygen. He did a chest x-ray that shows no focal consolidation um, to suggest any underlying pneumonia. So you do opt to treat her as an acute exacerbation of COPD. Um, I'm not going to pick on anybody right now. I just kind of want you to think throughout the presentation um, about if you would treat the patient with steroids um, and whether or not your decision would change if the patient were a diabetic. Um, so jumping into some brief physiology, um, we know that steroids have a widespread systemic effects um, when it comes to cardiovascular system, uh, system. They help to maintain the tone of our arterials and help promote cardiac contractility. Um, hematologists tend to love them because glucocorticoids cause destruction of lymphoid tissue, which is why they're commonly used in patients with lymphoma. They help protect against hemolysis of red blood cells um, and decrease the numbers of circulating uh, leukocytes, particularly your lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Um, when it comes to our electrolyte and water balance, um, they help maintain our GFR by regulating water excretion. Um, they do have roles in sodium retention, which is why they can cause exacerbations of heart failure. Um, probably the most notable one that we always think of is the decreased calcium absorption in the GI tract. Um, that can cause increased uh, excretion resulting in a net calcium loss, um, which is why osteoporosis is one of the complications of long-term steroid use, um, as well as within our nervous system and our immune system, um, where they suppress all types of hypersensitivity and allergic reactions. Um, from an eMERGE perspective, we love steroids because of their profound anti-inflammatory effects. <laughs> anything that I will try to explain today, um, but essentially they inhibit our neutrophils and monocytes um, in all areas of inflammation, as well as inhibiting the prostaglandin and leukotriene formation to help alleviate inflammation, um, but they do not correct the underlying cause of inflammation. Um, this slide I found, and I really like it because it just kind of simplifies um, how steroids actually um, work with regards to the anti-inflammatories as well as immunosuppressive effects. Um, for me, it just kind of helped to more or less dumb it down um, and make it a little bit easier for my non-pharmacological brain to understand. Um, just briefly on some pharmacokinetics. 
Um, all of our exogenous preparations are based on the uh, chemical structure of cortisol that allows for us to manipulate the um, balance of mineral corticoid to glucocorticoid effects in these drugs, as well as has an effect on their potency um, and the half-life duration. Um, all of our preparations um, have high bioavailability, but what's really nice with our steroids is that our oral uh, preparations also have high bioavailability, which is why things like prednisone and dexamethasone, when given orally, um, still work within just a couple of hours of ingestion, as well as they all have high first-pass metabolism. Um, and they work the exact same way as our endogenous glucocorticoids by binding to the corticosteroid uh, binding globulin um, after they undergo reduction in the liver to their uh, active chemical compound. Um, and then like, like most drugs, they're metabolized in the liver and excreted in the urine. Uh, so the bulk of the presentation, we'll talk about some indications for use in the eMERGE department. Um, like I had kind of alert, alluded to earlier, there's um, widespread effects, which gives us um, a lot of room to um, use them in the department. Um, so with respect to RASP, um, this is probably where we tend to use them the most just because of how often we're seeing patients with asthma and COPD in the department. Um, and we have some really good guidelines set out um, for both our pediatric and adult populations. Um, so for asthma, when it comes to PEDS, our best evidence is for moderate and severe exacerbations. Um, and there was a meta-analysis from 2014 that actually showed similar efficacy for dexamethasone um, versus prednisone or prednisolone. DEX has obviously become the more preferred agent um, because it does tend to result in less nausea and vomiting, as well as we can give it in one or two doses over a couple of days, as opposed to a daily dose of prednisone or prednisolone. Um, so the recommended doses for DEX for kids is 0.15 to 0.6 mil mix per kg, um, or one to two mix per kg for bread. Um, with adults, we have similar eff efficacy uh, for both oral and IV. Um, however, given that most of our patients are coming in um, working quite hard to breathe, um, they could be tiring, they could be altered in their level of consciousness, we tend to go with the IV route um, simply so that we don't risk any aspiration or vomiting. Um, in the department. Um, and then the optimal dose would be the equivalent of 150 milligrams of hydrocortisone, um, typically given within the first hour of presentation um, or at or just after the same time as bronchodilators. Um, similar to asthma, COPD um, is pretty similar. Um, Acute exacerbations of COPD are actually the most common cause of acute hospitalization in Canada. Um, and we know that steroids help to improve airflow as well as decrease the rate of treatment failure uh, or the risk of relapse when given early. And they do help to improve symptoms and decrease the length of stay in hospital. Um, so the Canadian Thoracic Society actually recommends uh, 25 to 50 milligrams of prednisone or equivalent for moderate to severe AECOPDs. They actually recommend um, a dose of seven to 14 days. Obviously, for most of our patients in the department that we're sending home, we're usually giving about five days um, and then recommending follow up with their primary care provider. Um, going back to PEDS, um, when it comes to croup, um, our best evidence is for DEX, again, at a dose of 0.15 to 0.6 um, mg per kg for all children presenting with croup. Um, and I just wanted to touch briefly on bronchiolitis because um, I've kind of seen some variations in practice um, from clerkship up until now. Um, there's actually no evidence um, for the use of corticosteroids alone, um, and there is some equivocal evidence for dexamethasone plus nebulized epi when given together, um, suggesting that it does decrease the frequency of admissions to hospital, um, but just giving them on their own actually has no benefit. Um, the other thing I just want to touch on too with regards to um, 
respiratory or upper respiratory tract infections um, is that while we previously used to give um, steroids out for things like people presenting with typical viral URTIs, um, again, that's not currently recommended um, by CAPE, by the CPS, by the Canadian Thoracic Society, and it's something that I've seen over the last few years that we've really been moving away from, which is good. Um, Anaphylaxis. Um, when I was reading the TREC guidelines, I was actually kind of surprised um, that for PEDS, steroids are not routinely recommended, um, but they're obviously still given quite frequently in practice. Um, and the reason they're not routinely recommended is that they haven't actually been shown um, to have an effect or decrease the risk of a biphasic reaction. Um, but in practice, they are still quite frequently given. And similar with adults, there's no clear guidelines, and most of our evidence um, is largely based off of, off of observational studies, um, simply because it's not ethical to do RCTs when it comes to patients um, presenting with anaphylaxis. Um, we know that steroids do decrease um, the length of stay, both in hospital as well as in the eMERGE department, um, but they really have no effect on whether a patient will uh, represent with future anaphylactoid reactions. And again, there's no real consensus on the effect um, that steroids have on a possible biphasic reaction. But if you are going to give them a recommended dose, it would be methylprat 125 milligrams IV for a one time dose. Um, one of the more controversial um, indications is that with regards to dermatology, um, there's a lot of varying opinions on the use of systemic steroids um, for certain dermatological presentations. Um, but again, some of the possible indications would be for more widespread dermatological conditions, um, such as if someone's presenting with an itchy rash that's too large of an area for a topical preparation, or if they've already had topicals um, and they haven't responded to them, or if they're refractory to first or second generation antihistamines. So things such as generalized urticaria, angioedema, um, or large areas of contact or allergic dermatitis. Um, and again, most dermatologists recommend using the lowest possible dose of prednisone. Um, and most patients actually see improvement with a, a dose of prednisone 20 milligrams a day for about four to five days. And most patients see improvement within the first 24 hours. Um, when it comes to endochrome presentations, um, obviously a lot of evidence for their use in adrenal crisis, um, using stress dose steroids, um, particularly in patients with known primary adrenal insufficiency who are chronically immunosuppressed. Um, and when patients are presenting with adrenal crisis, ideally you wanna use an agent that has both glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid properties. So something like hydrocortisone 100 milligrams IV. Um, However, if that's not available in your department, um, then the um, endocrinologists tend to recommend using DEX, um, which is primarily um, a glucocorticoid with um, fludrocortisone so that you do get that mineral corticoid um, effect as well. And then for thyroid storm, um, it's multi-beneficial given um, that patients are presenting with decreased adrenocortical reserve. Um, so it gives that boost. Um, and then specifically with regards to correcting the underlying condition, um, steroids actually help prevent the conversion of T4 to T3. So it's one of the few times that steroids actually help um, treat the underlying cause. And for that, um, you could use any one of hydrocortisone, dex, or betamethasone. For our autoimmune population, um, typically we're giving steroids in the eMERGE for acute, acute flares of um, certain autoimmune conditions or complications of things like lupus or Crohn's. Um, so some of our presentations will be lupus, um, rheumatoid or other inflammatory arthritis, um, sarcoids, scleroderma, or vasculitis. 
Oftentimes with these patients, if they're systemically well, um, our oral preparation, preparations such as prednisone are perfectly um, suitable. And then we want to make sure that they do have follow up with their primary care provider or rheumatologist. Um, I do just briefly want to touch on gout as well, because um, I have seen for, you know, acute gout flares and patients who um, have like a first presentation, um, jumping right to steroids, um, but they really are only recommended if the patient's already failed treatment with high dose NSAIDs or colchicine. Um, so that's something to think about as well for your future practice. Um, with regards to neuro, just kind of touching on meningitis, again, both in the pediatric and adult populations. Um, for peds, it's still pretty controversial. Um, there have been some studies that show steroids reducing the risk of hearing loss in kids, um, but they're not routinely recommended, and they're certainly not routinely recommended in neonates due to their effects on neurodevelopment. Again, it's a pretty patient-dependent and practitioner-dependent decision. Um, similar for adults, they are recommended if you're presuming a pneumococcal meningitis to help reduce the CSF inflammation, as well as has been shown to help reduce morbidity and mortality associated with pneumococcal meningitis. And for this, again, you're using DEX 10 milligrams IBQ6. Um, and again, you want to give it before or with the first dose of antibiotics. Um, more neurosurgical with regards to cerebral edema, but there is a role for glucocorticoids in edema that's caused by things such as intracranial hypertension or space occupying lesion, such as a tumor or an abscess. Um, and again, just nailing home that there's no role for increased um, ICP with regards uh, to trauma. And then we come to sepsis. <laughs> um, I really didn't want to make this a talk about sepsis, but I can't exactly do a talk on steroids without just briefly touching on it. Um, obviously, there's been a decades long standing controversy with regards to use of steroids in sepsis and septic shock. Um, it seems that for every one paper that's published that does show a benefit, there's another um, study published that refutes it. Um, most recently back in 2018 with the publication of the Adrenal and the Approach SS trials. Um, so again, it's largely physician dependent um, on who, which patient does and doesn't get it. But some of the widely accepted um, practices um, that I've seen and read about with regards to their use is in patients who um, are impressor resistant shock. So they've been adequately fluid resuscitated. They're on max dose of one or two um, vasopressors um, and they're still quite sick. Um, there has been shown some benefit. And then again, for any patient who is chronically immunocompromised, um, giving their stress dose steroids um, for those patients. Um, some of the newer evidence that's come um, out since sort of mid to late 2018 um, is looking at the evidence for combination therapy of steroids, vitamin C, and thiamine. Um, the initial paper, I believe, was published in late 2018. It was an observational study of one isolated ICU, um, but it did show a small effect on the overall mortality of 6%, 6 as well as a small reduction in the admission um, length of stay, both to hospital and the ICU. And the suspected mechanism is that there's just a synergistic effect um, that results in prevention of progressive and organ dysfunction. Um, and there's currently several randomized control trials in the works um, to help further evaluate that. So hopefully they'll be coming out um, in the next year or so. Um, this table I found, I will say it's from a very old paper, um, but I just put it here basically to highlight um, some of the common doses for our common presentations in the eMERGE department. Um, obviously it's old because there's things on here that we wouldn't really use steroids for anymore, um, but I did still think it was a pretty good uh, reference. Um, and then one of the um, big things that Dr. Richardson and I talked about when we were coming up with the idea um, for this talk is just how often we're giving steroids out in the department um, and not really thinking of some of the less common side effects or 
um, side effects that can arise even just with short-term use. A lot of the times when we think of adverse events related to steroids, we're thinking of um, adverse events related to chronic steroid use. So I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that I thought were interesting um, when going through some of the literature. So for this particular paper, um, it was published in 2018. Um, and it's a three year um, population based cohort study out of the states. Um, and so patients were either um, prescribed at least one short term corticosteroid um, in that three year period. Um, the median use um, was about six days. Um, and the indications that um, were noted patients were routinely prescribed um, steroids for were things like um, viral URTIs and spinal conditions, um, intervertebral disc disorders, allergies, bronchitis, and lower respiratory tract infections. Um, and one of the things I noted is that the most common prescribers are family docs, general internists, eMERGE docs, orthopods, and ENTs. Um, so what they looked at was the incidence of um, three different adverse events, so fractures, um, venous thromboembolism, as well as sepsis. And what they actually found is that the incidence for all three is higher in patients who had been prescribed steroids um, versus those who hadn't. Um, and when they further um, broke down whether patients were prescribed them for a respiratory condition versus an MSK condition, um, they found that the risk for each um, persisted in patients who had been prescribed steroids. Um, so overall, they found that fractures, um, there were 21 events uh, for every 1,000 users annually. Uh, for clots, it was five for 1,000, and sepsis was two. Um, and so the suggested mechanisms by which this happens um, for fractures, just basically the rapid alteration in the markers of bone metabolism, um, so the decrease in the serum concentrations of osteocalcin and propeptide um, are seen early um, in the weeks after starting prednisone, as well as your um, net calcium loss as well. Um, and then for VT and sepsis, it's much less understood at this time. The paper did make note um, of a possible connection between the fact that steroids do make you um, slightly immune compromised, putting you at a higher risk of infection, and then using infection as a risk factor for um, developing clots. Um, but again, it's still widely um, not understood at this point. Um, The other thing I'll just note with this paper too is that um, the risk for either um, of these three was highest in the first 30 days um, after prescription and then in the subsequent 31 to 90 days, the uh, risk dropped off significantly. Um, thereby um, telling us that we are seeing some of these um, less common um, risk factors just with a short course of um, steroids. This next paper um, was published in 2018, um, and it was comparing the fracture risk on patients um, given intermittent high-dose steroids um, for exacerbations of their COPD. Um, it's a case control study out of Europe that had over 600,000 cases and matched controls, and the mean age was 65. What they found um, is that patients who were given intermittent um, steroids did not have an increased risk of an osteoporotic hip or vertebral fracture compared to those without COPD. Um, and that was with an odds ratio of 0.65. Um, but what they did find was that the current use of steroids um, actually put patients at a higher risk, um, only to the fact that um, bone health can be affected um, really early um, in the use or with the use of steroids, um, which again is not something that I um, routinely have been um, counseling patients on when sending them home with a five-day prescription for prednisone. Um, so I thought that was um, quite interesting to read about. Um, and then lastly, um, I just wanted to touch on glucocorticoid-induced hyperglycemia. 
um, Perret and Al back in 2014 um, published this review article um, on the effects of glucocorticoids in patients who are baseline diabetics. Um, obviously, we know that steroids have a profound effect on glucose metabolism in the body. Um, the complete mechanism is well beyond anything that I'll talk about today. Um, but we do know that steroids um, increase our endogenous production of glucose in the liver. Also, they reduce the peripheral glucose uptake um, in our muscles and adipose tissues. And they also decrease production and secretion of insulin from the beta islet cells, um, kind of making them the perfect storm for um, our diabetic patients. Um, in the eMERGE, we're obviously really good at telling people that steroids can increase their glucose levels, and we do advise them to check their levels often. Um, but how often are we really telling them that they should be um, modifying their regimen or offering them tips and tricks on how to modify their regimen when we're sending them home? Um, what I really liked about the article is that it actually provided guidance on how to help and counsel patients with adjusting their meds. Um, and so even patients who are not insulin diabetic and they're just on um, oral therapy, um, the authors actually do suggest um, starting patients on insulin because most of our um, oral um, diabetic meds um, have no effect on glucocorticoid-induced hyperglycemia. So they do suggest that we be starting patients on insulin when prescribing um, steroids. Um, but again, that's not really something that we're going to do in the eMERGE department. That's something that more internists um, or family doctors would be doing. Um, however, if that's something that you're comfortable with, um, then this table is um, a nice sort of um, a reference. They do unfortunately use NPH, which uh, as a reference, um, but there's tons of conversion charts out there that would um, easily um, be of use. Um, however, um, it's not unreasonable for us to make suggestions for patients who are already on um, insulin at baseline. Um, and this table just kind of nicely um, outlines how we should be counseling patients um, and can act as a guide for that. Um, ultimately, the author suggests um, that anybody who is on insulin at baseline, we should be suggesting that they increase their total insulin daily dose by 20 to 30% every three days as needed while they're on their insulin. Um, and obviously, um, patients having good close follow-up with their primary care provider um, is going to be really important um, to help prevent any um, hypoglycemia. Um, and just kind of interestingly, I had a patient a couple of days ago um, who had prednisone listed on her allergy um, list. And when I asked her about it, um, or sorry, she said she had prednisone as an allergy. And when I asked her about it, um, she actually said she was advised to never have steroids again because of her diabetes and she ended up in ICU with HHS, um, which I thought was pertinent to this week. Um, so now I just kind of want to bring it back to our case um, of our very typical 63 year old who's coming in to emerge with her acute exacerbation of COPD. Um, obviously I think we would all still treat the patient with steroids, um, but I just kind of want to open it up um, to the group now on whether your decision would change um, if the patient was a diabetic. Um, and obviously if anybody has um, any questions, we can open it up um, to the group. Right. Well, quiet, quiet group. Um, great job, Alana. Um, good information. I'm hoping, I think the reason I had suggested this topic was in chatting with one of our other colleagues who brought it up to me. We don't always consider the short-term effects of steroids. We're all very familiar with the long-term complications, but not necessarily the short-term complications. And yet we give it out like candy 
for everything from you know asthma sepsis to somebody with hives and and i just hope it will give people pause um and maybe think twice about uh, giving it out in the way that we do or perhaps looking at other uh, dosing regimens so any other thoughts out there from uh from faculty or residents Hi, Lynn, it's Justin Yan here. Um, thanks for that talk, and it's, it's such a huge topic, so uh, good job in trying to cover everything, because <laughs> even... I, you know, I really tried to narrow in as best as I could, um, but it's a massive topic. Yeah, yeah, and trying to kind of slam that into an hour-long grand rounds is, is quite an aggressive feat. Um, yes. uh, I have one comment and one question for you. Um, sure. The comment I, I'm going to make, it's just um, having done some work with patients with diabetes and it's really more of a semantics, politically correct PC sort of thing, just to point out for everyone is that um, the, the politically correctness of saying, you know, if somebody is a diabetic versus somebody who has diabetes, increasingly oh, there's just a move toward trying to be politically correct with it. And I know that I've, I've done it too. And I think traditionally we've all, we've, we've probably referred to people with diabetes as diabetics, but I uh, just mm -hmm. want to point out that increasingly we want to um, not define people by their disease and um, say, you know, pa patients who have diabetes versus patients who are diabetics. So that I just want to yep. point that out just for everyone um, to be just conscious of that when, um, when treating and caring for people with di diabetes. Um, the question that I had was, and I know this isn't really necessarily a, 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 an indication in the ED for why we would start someone on steroids, but because it's a hot topic and because of what's going on in the world today, did you come across any kind of um, reading about COVID and steroids? Um, you know, with the recovery trial, there's several like systematic reviews and meta-analyses on when steroids might be indicated for COVID patients and when not and what kind of potential harms and, and benefits. So I don't know if that was something that was in your scope. And again, it's fine if it's not because it's such a huge scope that you're trying to cover here, but I don't know if that was something that you, came, that you uh, can comment on. I will admit that I 100% avoided looking at anything COVID related for this topic. <laughs> okay, just wanted to ask. Hey, Justin. Uh, it's Chantal. I just wanted to jump in. We had, uh, with our virtual sim yesterday, we had two of the uh, docs from the COVID clinic, uh, Nicholson and Marco Brada, uh, were both in on the conversation, and uh, we talked about steroids. Essentially, the dose for steroids is six milligrams, uh, either oral or IV, for um, seven to ten days, and it's generally recommended for COVID patients with moderate or severe disease, so those who have SATs below 94%. Um, their recommendation was um, only to give it um, if the patient is going to be coming into hospital or if they're going to be um, at least followed up at the um, at the COVID clinic because that way they can follow them for some of these short-term side effects. In particular, they're seeing a lot of uh, hyperglycemia. So um, there is a recommendation, but only in those patients who are borderline needing to come in because their SATs are low or are going to be monitored very, very closely as outpatients. Thanks, Chantal. And I think that that's what the evidence would support too, is that those who are on, for instance, supplemental O2 or who have ARDS are the ones that would benefit the most from steroid use and not necessarily the ones that are being discharged from the ED. So um, it was there. I, I'm sorry I missed the, uh, the debrief. I did the actual case online, but I couldn't attend the debrief. But was there, was there thought that we shouldn't be the ones starting it? Or is it something that we can administer when we're going to be referring to respirology? for a presumed COVID case or ICU? Like what, what, what should be our role, I guess, is the question from, from their perspective. They didn't seem to mind either way as long as there was the follow-up. Um, so if you are going to administer it, you should know that they're going to be seen by respirology or the, the COVID clinic uh, in the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, and if they're getting admitted, then uh, you know, kind of your own personal comfort if you would like to start it versus uh, let the inpatient team. But I think the evidence is there to say that if they're uh, under 94% uh, with these SATs at rest, then I don't think it's unreasonable to start it. But definitely not mandatory if that's not in someone's personal comfort zone. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chantal, I, I unfortunately also had a meeting uh, at the same time yesterday, so I missed it. But just to clarify, my conversations with medicine have been that they would prefer 
us to wait until the COVID swab results are back. Did anybody comment on that? I'm talking for COVID positive patients, so not- Okay, so presume, not presumed COVID, so wait, waiting on the positive results. Yeah, yeah, COVID positive with the low SATs. Yeah, Laura, and Thanks. all the studies have looked at um, uh, COVID positive confirmed patients as well. So I think that the evidence would support that as well. Okay, great. Thanks. Lana, it's John Dreyer. Uh, thanks for that talk. Um, I wonder if you had anything to say about um, avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Um, I've seen a couple of patients now. They're not very common, but um, one I remember most clearly was uh, a, uh, uh, a man in his 40s who uh, uh, worked outside a lot and uh, got uh, very frequent episodes of um, uh, dermatitis secondary to poison ivy. Uh, and every time he had had such an event, uh, his family physician had put him on 50 milligrams of prednisone a day for a week. And um, uh, he wasn't warned about, you know, pain in the in the uh, the hip or anything like that, although it's probably too late at that point. Um, and he ended up having to have both of his hips replaced uh, in his 40s. Um, and um, he also actually developed uh, avascular necrosis of his uh, humeral heads as well, which I hadn't heard of before. But uh, um, did you come across any of that? Or do you have any thoughts about, um, you know, what we should be doing in terms of warning patients about this? Um, I didn't come across anything that um, looked at like the risk of that specifically, um, but in the paper that I had mentioned about um, the risk of hip fractures and um, vertebral fractures, they did mention it um, just sort of briefly as an aside um, that again, kind of similar to the mechanism by which you would get a fracture, you can have avascular necrosis because it does um, decrease that bone remodeling um, quite significantly within the first few days. So I think it's something that we should be um, counseling our patients on. Um, and especially if people are going to be having sort of long-term or um, high doses frequently of steroids, then they did briefly mention um, kind of prophylaxis with bisphosphonates for anybody um, who is high risk, um, but didn't really go into a whole lot of the mechanism behind it. Yeah, I, I don't think, I, I, somebody else may know better than I do, but I don't think the avascular necrosis is related directly to the, uh, you know, changes in bone metabolism, but rather it's the, uh, it's uh, something goes on with the vasculature to the, uh, to the head of the, the femur. Um, I, I would be interested in anybody else's comments about um, adjusting doses of prednisone because my experience over the last many years is that uh, we reflexly tend to reach for or prescribe 50 milligrams because it's convenient, it's a single tablet. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, um, particularly with um, smaller, uh, smaller people. Um, uh, elderly people who you know, have less body mass. Um, and as you pointed out, um, in many cases, uh, when you're using it for a dermatological condition, I think you, uh, you quoted a paper or had some information about using just 20 milligrams a day, um, which to me makes a lot more sense. I mean, you, we typically see them at a given point in time. If we start them on 20 milligrams a day, um, and we encourage them to follow their family physician. Um, the other benefit of doing that is then they go in to see their family physician and their family physician says, oh, well, of course it's not better. Uh, and they can increase the dose. Um, so it makes the family physician look good. Not to say we want to look bad, but uh, if 20 milligrams a day is in fact adequate for many patients, then um, you know maybe we should start with that and then let somebody else adjust it upwards if, if needed. Does anybody else do anything similar to that? I guess not. <laughs> um, Alana, I did have actually one more question for you. Um, in terms of like dose dependence of the adverse effects, um, and the, the indication I'm thinking of, and again, it's not something that we're necessarily initiating without Neuro's input, but 
um, oftentimes someone who's got like a bad MS flare, for instance, ne neurology mm -hmm. is, I, I've been instructed by neurology at, at times to start people on these massive doses of steroids, which I have to admit when I first did that um, under neuro's guidance, I was just like super uncomfortable with just because we're used to the 50 milligram dosage and and the, the ne neurologists for MS flares are giving um, doses that are, that are like 10 times that. Um, did you come across anything in your reading looking at the, the adverse events um, uh, related to the dose dependence, particularly for MS patients at all? I didn't come across anything specifically with regards to MS patients. Um, some of the things that I did read um, actually didn't find any like significant, significant difference between like high dose steroids versus low dose. So you were just as likely to have an adverse outcome if you had 20 milligrams a day versus something like upwards of 60 a day. Um, so I didn't find anything specific, but um, that's certainly um, something that can and should be looked into. Hi, Elena. Hi. It's a, hi, it's a Sean Kane. Uh, I had a question there. Um, about it was just a comment you about the gout of having reluctance to prescribe prednisone for the first episode in particular. I there's admittedly prednisone is not my, my first go to for gout, but there are situations where a uh, history of a GI bleed and uh, also a bit of renal failure in the background that make NSAIDs uh, and colchizine a less desirable option. Was there a particular reason mm -hmm. uh, with the first episode why there should be reluctance with the prednisone in particular? It's just something that I've seen in practice that I've always just kind of questioned, which is why I brought it up more than anything else. Um, like I've seen several family docs just kind of give it out um, in patients who are coming in a, instead of trying something um, in an otherwise healthy patient who hasn't had, um, like who has no contraindications to NSAIDs or colchicine. Um, so it was just something that I thought was important to mention. Okay, thanks a lot. It's uh, Kelly. I don't know, I don't just know. a quick comment, um, uh, especially with Alana. I don't know, I, I thought you would pick the topic because there was like a recent MRAP. Uh, I think in November they covered a, in like the abstracts podcast, they covered like a big Taiwanese study, I want to say, um, where actually they found that the rate of GI bleed was actually quite significantly higher for patients on a steroid burst. I think the median was like 10 milligrams for like three days. And so it's funny that uh, Dr. King mentioned that because it sounds like from their study, they're wondering if uh, they found that GI bleeds were increased. So I don't really know if using steroids is any better than using NSAIDs if you're trying to avoid a GI bleed. Great point, thanks. All right, well, if there's no other questions or points for discussion, I think we can end it there um, and give all the residents time to get a coffee before their next session. Okay, well, thanks again, Alana, and thank you everybody for uh, participating in some nice, fulsome discussion. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>